The Warrior Bride, Part 1 Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 12 to 13 Since Scripture repeatedly warns us about the trials and tribulations which are to come, and especially so as the day of the Lord draws ever closer, it should come as no surprise that despite the eternal victory of the cross, the authority of the believer, and as we have seen in the previous Quick Bite series, The Bride Has Come of Age, the accession of the bride to royal position, it should come as no surprise that hardships and persecution still await us. It is not a message many readily accept, preferring instead the grandeur of an alternate and spurious exegesis which distort the word of God to a far more palatable consideration, one that elevates either the individual believer to a pre-resurrection glorification and in some cases even escaping death altogether, or an exegesis that elevates the church to a reincarnation of the Lord himself in a way that negates the need for his return at all. Since they all teach, it will be through the church that the Antichrist will be overthrown and the kingdoms of this world subdued. My question is, how did we ever arrive at such error when Scripture makes it abundantly clear otherwise? Later in this series, I will expand a little more about these heresies, but for now, it behooves me to attest to this important and foundational truth. Things will get worse before the Lord's glorious second coming, which will be just as the angels at his ascension declared when they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come again in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Acts chapter 1 verse 11. Jesus will return in the same manner, that is, in his glorified physical body. Here's what Jesus himself taught us. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my sake, and then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. 
And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Matthew 24, verses 3 to 14. No matter what exegetical wrangling or attempt to reframe this Olivet Discourse, we simply cannot alter one iota of what Scripture so adamantly teaches that things will get worse before the Lord's bodily return. Hope is misplaced if it relies upon a triumphant church before this second coming. As Paul writes, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, Titus 2 verse 13. Or later he also writes, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. Now, it is certainly not my intention to preach doom and gloom, far be it, for there is hope now and joy now. There is strength now and a victorious position now. Indeed, there is much to celebrate, not only in the glories to come, but in the favor that awaits us right now. Prayer remains remains most effective right now. And the bride has come of age, meaning she has crossed a legal threshold, granting her full rights directly as a bride rather than vicariously through a guardian. But it is necessary from the onset of this new series on the warrior bride and spiritual warfare to provide the context into which all our teaching and prophetic principles must align. This prophetic timeline of the Olivet Discourse provides a backbone for all other subsequent teaching, revelation, revelation, and prophecy. You see, there is an important distinction between the warfare of the bride and the warfare of the church. Let me say that again. There is an important distinction between the warfare of the bride and the warfare of the church. Now, that might sound strange, since I make no distinction between the bride and the church, but it is a matter of the heart and the maturity of love to which I refer. The bride. The bride has been in the wilderness, and she knows without a shadow of doubt to whom she belongs, and her sole desire is for her beloved to come for her. She isn't fighting for vineyards or territory, even though the offer is given for half the kingdom. The fire of true love cannot be appeased by anything other than being together in love's embrace and union. This is how Song of Songs finishes in chapter 8 and foreshadows Revelation twenty-two seventeen, which says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Listen to these last verses of Song of Songs. In verse 13 of chapter 8, The Beloved, you who dwell in the guardians, the companions listen for your voice. Then he says, let me hear it. (laughs) Hear a window into the Lord's heart and reveals his longing 
to hear his bride's voice. Then the final verse in this love poem of Song and of Songs gives her beautiful response. The Shulamite says, Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. Wow, so beautiful, so enchanting. Here, the portrayal of love awakened in all its simplicity when she says, Make haste, my beloved. This is the cry of the bride who says, Come, but not in some lovesick, rose-colored glasses way that reduces her to a state of passivity, oh no, but a ferocity of love that will not be satisfied with anything other than love's reward or traded for the allure of anything in this life. Here's what Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 7 says. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Let's be clear. The bride is fighting for all those she can advocate for. She is fighting for love, and she is fighting for her bridegroom's return. The bride embraces the fellowship of sharing in her beloved suffering because it provides the veil through which she is invited to love him at death's unknown. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, that's the beginning of this series on the warrior bride. But it's important to lay this marker and context down, understanding, yes, the end is coming near. But there is a battle that only the bride can engage in in a way that prepares for the return of her beloved king. Until next time, God bless you.